Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackel Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Urban American, The Wickoff Group. <laughs>
need for vendors to fill up their plate with business to pay their overhead is overpowering and to use an expression they're dropping their drawers. I do not believe you will buy trades cheaper ever again than you can right now because people are taking business to stay in business in the residential sector. Joel, you agree with him? I can't, I can never agree with him altogether, but I, <laughs> yeah. but, but I, I agree partially. I, I think it's a wonderful time to, to try to build residential stuff. The supply is uh, getting eaten up, uh, the construction prices are low, interest rates are still low, and I think you'll be building into a rising marketplace. Having said that, it's, uh, the credit is extremely tight. Uh, I think you're in the first cycle of, of credit. It always happens the same way, except with each cycle it seems harder. First, there's no money. Then there's money to those who they should lend money to in the first place. And then there's money for everybody so that the, the whole cycle starts all over again. And I think we're at the beginning of the uh, part now that money's starting to go to people that should get the money because they're seasoned developers and they know how to build. Now, you're building a project on 20, 29 Flatbush Avenue. Correct. In, in Brooklyn. And then, you know, that's one project. And then you're also building 57th Street, you know, <clears throat> uh, five-star Hyatt and luxury condos. What's, what's the difference in construction costs? And how do, you see the, how do you see the market on those two different deals? Well, I would say the range right now is the, you know, the high 200s uh, for a, uh, a rental product. And they can go, you know, five to $600 for the highest end finishes in the condominiums that, that you know, will warrant you know, the, the $3,000 sale price that uh, the developers are looking to get. Do you think you can do a construction job for a union construction uh, residential in the high 200s, Joe? Uh, I think that's pretty tough. I mean, we, we, we have, uh, we're going to be finding out relative to something we're working on. I, I would certainly hope that uh, we can get it under 350 uh, for a standard high rise. But again, everything, it, it's hard to stereotype because it would depend on floor plate. Right. Uh, number yeah, of floors, sure. uh, the amenities, you know, so it, it really is hard to stereotype. But I think that uh, factors are favorable at this particular point, including, uh, you know, a lot of open labor issues now in terms of uh, union negotiations that uh, uh, there's a number of contracts that expire at the end of June. And then you also have su uh, supplies today. I mean, you know, the world economy and you have uh, oil prices spiking and so forth. So I think it's hard to stereotype buildings and costs. But how much is the difference between the construction of a union job versus a non-union job? You know, I know, I, I know all of you are union yeah, I think, I think builders, it, but it, I'm it just... It used to be, people would say, 20 to 25 percent. And that was when the market was white hot. And, and I think it was because con you couldn't get contractors. It was supply and demand, uh, as Jeff had, had referred to. But I had said once this Hot, white hot market calmed down and really went down significantly. I think it's a combination, Jeff, of productivity. And when I say productivity, these firms that are trying to meet their overhead are telling their key people, you know, you're not putting up five life fixtures a day, you better give me 10. You know, you're going to be so many square feet of drywall. That converges. So you're talking much more predictive. Productivity. And productivity then brings the price down. So uh, I was, I heard. Jeff, you said you think it may be 10 to 15 percent, and I, that's what I had well, I, been I think in predicting. various types of construction, as we right. stated before, whether you stick and brick and block and plank, that primarily belongs in the boroughs and the outer boroughs to non-union contractors. They've controlled that area for many years now. If it's a high-rise area, which has been specifically union, and rightfully so in many cases, because the need for administrative capability and safety, right. which is so important to us all, has really ruled that domain. But over these last four to five years, with the economics becoming so difficult to develop residential properties, you've seen non-union contractors grow into that area, and they're all learning their trade. You know, I, I don't want to bring up, you know, if you look at this Tea Party movement, if you look at Ohio, you look at Wisconsin, I mean, th there's a lot of, you know, anti-union sentiment around the country. I mean, we haven't seen that really in New York City. But do you think that could permeate into New York City in the construction world? Well, I, I think we recognize that, yeah. that it needs to cost less. And, and you know, the, 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 the dynamics of the way a real estate deal was, was financed and structured uh, is different, much more equity required into deals. And there has to be kind of a correction in the marketplace. Uh, I think where we probably differ with the unions, the unions think this is, uh, you know, that we will recover and things go back to the way they were. And I'm sure 
you know, people that uh, have more development experience than I do thinks that this is going to probably be for a longer term. I think the so. major thing is that you pencil numbers, and at the prices we have to pay, the numbers don't work. So the numbers have to come down and nothing gets built, or, or developers don't use union contractors. So it, it, it behests both but, but union yeah. contractors and the labor movement to come down. Because I think most of the price improvement at this point is really from uh, profit margins from Absolutely. subcontractors. Well, and you do, but you and also. Not, and not from labor givebacks. Right. But not labor givebacks, but what Frank was saying about productivity is 100% right, but not necessarily on the labor level. What's happened, because we're not operating at peak capacity, you're getting the best foremen, the right. best project Correct. managers, the best superintendents. So all of a sudden, the jobs are running better, and therefore they're more but, but productive. Aren't the raw right. That's where they can lower their prices. The A teams, essentially. Right. But aren't the raw materials, uh, the, the the fixtures, costing more because of uh, the higher energy cost? The but I have to tell you, in New York City, you know, the labor is so much more of a factor in our cost of creation than it is in the rest of the country. Yes, it's true. If gypsum board goes up a few cents a foot, or if copper goes up a few pennies a pound, the component of the raw material in the fabricated goods that it delivers to the job is not that great a factor considering the overall cost of the project. Well, I don't know necessarily agree with that. <laughs> I mean, you know, materials are a, a big portion of, of what it, labor, no, labor is larger. Raw materials. But materials, it's a, it's a real wild card, I think. You know, it's a roller coaster ride in terms of people, uh, steel goes up, steel goes down, oil goes up, it affects a lot well, of materials. What about, you know, Frank is saying, said before, you know, certain projects are, are, are taking place that were on hold. How many, what's the, what's the cycle today? Uh, I mean, when NYU Medical Center made the decision that they were going to build new towers, you said it was five years ago they made that decision. They gave away the job. How long, I mean, Mount Sinai, how many years do they plan for construction? I mean, and when, you, when you're working on a job, how, how long do you know? I mean, or is the jobs coming now? Are they happening within six months or are they happening within three years? And well, uh, I'm sorry, I, I think every job's a little bit different, so the, the gestation period or the pre-construction yeah. period for a hospital is, you know, can be four or five years, uh, particularly some of the, the more sophisticated buildings, the research building at Mount Sinai, we're building the research building, Joe's building, Joe's building the residential tower, uh, the new uh, Mind Brain Behavior building at Columbia University. Uh, so people are trying to anticipate, you know, what, what the way that people are going to research uh, cures for for illnesses is going to be, you know, five years. Frank, you you have you have a lot of construction with the institution. Yeah. What are you seeing? No, it, it, at least two years, you know, in, in pre-construction and planning, and then getting the development groups together, and and it could be more. I mean, at the larger institutions, Lincoln Center could be four right. or five years out before you expect to do the work on some of the larger projects that they're planning. But you know, some of those institutions. I, I mean, there was a great story, and I mean, maybe Joel will remember. Uh, there, was a, there was an accountant by the name of Sam Leidersdorf. And Sam Leidersdorf, uh, which became then Ernst, Ernst and Young, Young, and Leidersdorf was the treasurer of the MYU hospital. It wasn't called the MYU Medical Center. And Leidersdorf, they had no debt. And he said, because right now the buildings are built on Leidersdorf's garden, because he said, you know, you can take my garden if you can build. But he wouldn't build unless he had the money in hand. You know, he... I, I want the charity money. Okay, I had to have the money in town, which, as you know, because you sit on uh, continuum, that's not the world not the, the world. world today. How many, you know, the institutional world, Lincoln Center survives by governmental work, you know, plus, you know, if Koch and other charitable people aren't there. Is that the fact? You're seeing that on the university, the substance in the hospitals? Well, certain projects, the ones that are going are the ones that have designated donors, money's there, not waiting for a lot of pledges. What we're finding, okay, two projects, one in Princeton, one at Columbia University, uh, is in that case. I mean, you know, pledges, I'm sure you've probably taken hits on some of the pledges. Oh, yeah, everybody takes Everyone hit takes hits. I mean, they, so you know, Lincoln when the actuarial catch up. Excuse me? Lincoln Center is still playing catch up to yeah. get the rest of the money in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so I guess they have, to, they have to take that into consideration. That's probably why they wait. One of the areas we're involved with is uh, subsidized housing, be it affordable or seniors. We have a project on the boards that will begin in Staten Island, we hope, in the next few months. And there... Staten it, Island? You know what that borough is? <laughs> absolutely. Having said that, the cobbling of subsidy, um, whether it be from you know the EDC or, or whichever agencies are allocating money towards the good purposes of the project, 
the tax abatement, the bond issues are all very complicated today, so it adds to the lead time in these projects, yeah. which is an important factor. Yeah, I mean, certainly with institutions, uh, HUD put out a lot of the hospital money in New York, and they got a little bit of cold feet because right. about, I think, 75% of, of uh, hospitals' uh, HUD money was in New York as opposed to the rest of the country. But I, uh, philanthropy is a large part of anything you try to do. Uh, there's some institutions that try to sell off pieces of property uh, that they own to create additional sums to build what they have to I build. I mean, look, that's and part the gestation of the, period is. Let's look. Says, that's part of the uh, the bankruptcy also. court right now in St. Vincent's. You know, the bankruptcy court is going to get money by the sale of some of the property. Correct. You know, to build the residential and then to also to have the North Shore LIJ medical right. clinic. You brought up Princeton. What's the differential in cost in building in Princeton versus building in New York City? I can't. Uh, our really experience is is that it's it's appreciable. So, uh, you know, we uh, just we're doing as much as as much as twenty five percent. Someone said to me a couple of years ago, I had Mitch Hirsch from Matt Cowley, and he, you know, building all the Jersey City type of deals. They're, they're talking about a hundred dollars difference. They're talking more than twenty percent. They think that well, I, I think that may have been at the peak of the market when the difference was exaggerated by everybody's level of business. But you don't have to go as far as Princeton, New Jersey. Right here in the five boroughs, there's a market difference in construction costs between Manhattan and Brooklyn, Brooklyn. or Queens, for instance. You know, there are a number of new buildings being put up on the waterfront of Williamsburg, um, talk about Long Island City and Greenpoint. And the fact of the matter is, where $300 a foot is a target number, obviously, it can in go New York City, in Manhattan. In Manhattan, in a very you know, effective time to buy. You can do slightly better than that in Brooklyn because the staging, the logistics are all somewhat... I think easy. that was exactly what uh, Mitch Hirsch emphasized, that the staging and the logistics in Jersey City were much easier than right. Manhattan. I mean, you talk about well, a construction nothing's harder worker. than Manhattan. Nothing. You talk about a construction <laughs> worker having right. to come into Manhattan via public transportation or parking their car at 40 or $50 a day. Some of these expenses and time factors are taken out of the equation if you're working outside of Manhattan itself. You know, I, I had a discussion on a show a couple of weeks ago with a number of bankers, and uh, you know, uh, I, and I said, "How do you make the decision of who's the next customer that you should lend to?" We were talking about Twenty Third Street before, uh, as an example. You know, these were unproven developers in the heyday. The banks were giving money to anyone. How do you, when you're looking at a deal, somebody says to you, Frank? I got this land, I have this, you know, they tell you they have money from California. You know, it's like the CIM boys, you know, on, on 57th Street. And they do have money over there. How do you make that decision that you're going to do a deal? I mean, let's use a great, I hate, hate to bring it up. Take your hotel downtown. It was a great deal. But these guys were inexperienced and now uh, yeah, under it, it was it, it was a, a tough project for them. Um, but, I mean, in general, they, they want to build a, we, we, we're finding now that they're likely to get a performance bond. You know, the bank would like a performance bond so that they could get the financing. You know, so a lot of the developers are looking for firms that can provide the performance bond. How hard is it to get? I mean, I remember Levine once saying to me, you want a performance bond? I'm charging you for the performance bond. You know, if you want it, you're going to... Yeah, of course, but it's more yeah. than just a simple charge, as Joe I, will tell you. Right, the you bond. have to have the experience. You have to have the credit yeah. worth right. and the capability in order to get the, the, you, bond. the, constru the insurance company to provide the bond yeah, for It's you. a combination <laughs> of, of uh, what's on your balance sheet and experience and right. reputation and relationships. What about retail? I mean, I, I hear office, I hear residential. Do we see any major retail construction taking place in the five boroughs? Well, there is some major construction going on, some of it having been conceived earlier in time before, you know, the trouble began back in 07 and 08. You have downtown Brooklyn, you have the huge project by Acadia, um, which I believe is probably close to a half a million square feet. In but it's a phase. It's a little bit like your 57th Street project. Yeah. You know, it's phased in, they got certain Obama money originally for the first 50,000 square feet, and they really can't build on the balance until, you know, later on, you know, when, they, when the world changes on that. I mean, New York City, urban retail is still a great business because there's not enough, uh, what you saw. Urban retail is a great, I mean, you know, as you know, a couple of years ago, we did this big uh, shopping center in Harlem, which uh, served an under needed, underserved community, and, and it did great. And, and retail is a very complicated subject because nothing's affected, uh, the internet hasn't affected any 
thing in, in our, it certainly doesn't affect residential building or com commercial building, maybe to some extent, but retail in terms of what you can buy online and so forth, it's a uh, very difficult decision as to the size of the store and what stores of the future are going to work, know, what retail... You, you bring out a, a great comment. Uh, right. We were talking about this, you know, with the demise of borders. I mean, 10 years right. ago, since we're all here, we've been go. around. Remember 10 years ago, there were these stores called Sam Goody. They were Coconuts Records. Right. You know, Blockbusters. They, Blockbusters. Blockbusters, I mean, yeah. but, but these were stores that people would have the, in every mall or every place you, I remember on, on 6th Avenue, you had this major, which is now either a Dwayne or Records. Sovereign. Okay, you had all these record stores. You don't have that. So that world was taking so up the products are internet. changing in terms of right. where well, they sell. Yeah, but that's what, you have an AT&T telephone store in every mall, as well as every other Okay. Own supplier. Absolutely. They, I mean, that's what Andy Grove called an inflection point. You know, it's when the lumberyard didn't see Home Depot coming. You know, your business is your business model is going out the window, and that's what happened to Blockbuster, and, and it's unbelievable. I mean, you but, if, on but the, if you on the internet now. if you look at all of the Home Depots, which have been converted to either Costco or other situation, I mean, East River Plaza that was supposed to be a Home Depot. Right. You know, and in the same manner of what you said, look, East River Plaza took them only 20 years to do the deal, and it's. A, Totally different neighborhood than where you are right. in Harlem. And I think they have a different type of clientele. People who go down there either drive or they have the car services. I mean, they have the car service waiting right outside of East River Plaza to take people around. Uh, at Harlem, USA, it's a totally different world. What's happening with the other project over there in Harlem? The, the we, construction? Are, uh, we have another parcel that's right next to the Apollo Theater. And uh, we've been trying for a few years to get an anchor of... Uh, tenant for it. And we're pretty close, I think. Um, and then the question is whether we're going to use the total zoning up or we're just going to build a, a piece of retail. We were talking before about hospitality. Frank was uh, emphasizing that lower Manhattan needs more hospitality today. How much construction, I mean, hospitality was the first market to get hit at the time, and it was the first market to recover. And the world has gotten better. But there are 6,400 new rooms in different phases of construction, like the Mondrian just opened. That was 150 rooms or something like that. Do you see a lot of new uh, hotel construction? Well, I, I think Lower Manhattan is going to have a huge opportunity. I just had a, chaired a panel with Julie Menon, the head of Community Board 1, and Jano from Silverstein and Steve Plate from the Port Authority. And when you look at their plans for Ground Zero and the number of tourists they're expecting to visit that $9 million a year, and the fact that $34 billion is being spent in one square mile right now, which is Lower Manhattan, and it's the fourth largest business district in the nation, mm -hmm. that to me is a sleeper. And I think you're going to need the hotels Condé Nast coming down. People are going to say, why should I take the subway from uptown? I'll live downtown. You know, I can walk to work. Uh, I think that you're going to have, you have different tenants downtown. They're not all financial. I think, I've been saying it for a long time, but I think it's finally happening. I think that Lower Manhattan needs more hotels, uh, and, and, and they're going to start to be built. I think the Four Seasons will probably go, go ahead soon. You, you know, but I think you're, you're relating to Condé Nast. You know, 15 years ago, uh, when Hudson Square wasn't Hudson Square, you know, Trinity Church's property, that was all printers. I mean, you go downtown. When, I'm, when I go to Wins at 345 Hudson Street, it's media. It's yeah. magazines, it's right. radio, it, you know, it's a Same different thing world. at Seven World Trade Center. Well, they in have part, this is why New York City has survived so well, that we got out of the manufacturing business of printing and garment center so many years ago that that job loss as a result of its uneconomic activity was replaced by finance, real estate, insurance, media, entertainment. That's why New York has done so well and will continue to do so well. Do you see any more five-star hotels? That, uh, on there, there's a five-star product that uh, we're doing on 57th Street. And, um, and a three-star product on, on 45th Street. That's a three-star. Yeah. That's so, it. but, you know, tourism has has been, you know, very strong. You know, New York is still the place that people want to be. And I think that you will see, you know, the, the, and the hotel numbers, are, they've come back, you know, remarkably amazing. well. You, you know, are very in, in addition to being in, in construction, many, the three of you guys are in development. And, it, and it, you know, there's a question that has to hit. And we were talking about it, and I have to bring it up. Real estate taxes. I mean, you know, people, it's the postponement. And I still remember the, the young person buying an apartment in Jeff Levine's building on 23rd Street. She says, oh, there's a tax abatement. All I'm paying is $132 uh, for, for real estate taxes. I said, you're 27. When you're 37, that 122 is going to be $1,300. Because all it is is a postponement to later on. Right. 
what effect is that having on your development hat, on your construction hat, as opposed to your, your development hat? Well, it has a twofold effect. As we said earlier, the tax abatement is a band aid to mask the problem that our taxes are too damn high. <laughs> having said that. But how do we pay our New York City expenses? I mean. Well, I think uh, you have to have an adjustment, a, re a better redistribution of taxation, because right now the taxation is being used to some degree as a political tool to affect um, elections. You know, elected officials don't want to raise taxes on their constituents because that will make them unhappy and they will be voted out. But new buyers are not voting yet, and they move in on those terms and they accept them. Right, but Joel was saying that he, he has a West Side project, and the, the only way it's going to take place, and he may have the construction money because he's established, has a lot of equity, is the taxes. Yeah, well, you're, you're talking about the 421A, which uh, expires and nobody will be able to build a new building in this town, I believe, without having 421A. You just need it. So there's two, several problems. One, you can't build a new product without the 421A. And then, as you started to allude to before, Michael, is when it expires, what happens then? And I think a lot of owners are being stuck with very high tax bills that really make no sense. Something has to be done to have a, an adjustment, plus the fact you have an unequal distribution. Co-ops co uh, are taxed at a much lower, lower rate. Than right. right, right. But what, what, you know, it, it relates more on this situation. We still have, I mean, there are new buildings being built, new office buildings. We have all of these uh, old uh, buildings which really aren't good in the lower Manhattan for office construction. I was, I was in a building yesterday on Reckless Street. I couldn't believe the condition. I, I mean, you know, I walked in there. The guy says, I'm paying $18 a foot. I can understand why you're paying $18 a foot. <laughs> uh, but but my, my comment is the 421Gs, which really helped the city, which was the full tax abatement, uh, you know, for lower Manhattan, do you see that coming back? I mean, uh, I mean that's what's going to... I mean, a lot of people are not going to move into these office buildings. I mean, they're in such dire shape. Remember J51? J51. Yeah. Do we, uh, do you, do we see the... The, the return of the J-51 ever? I would hope so. Well, I, I think the solution really is not to keep masking the problem, but to readjust taxation so it's fair to all and more even and doesn't punish the new construction development while benefiting what's existing. How well, do we need some a, work now, so we'll take the 420. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we get a voice at the table? Rebney, we, you were on the commission, yeah. the mayor's commission. Yeah, Joe. well, that, that was what sort of narrowed the 421A, and then it expired. And, uh, uh, you know, they, at the time of that commission, everything was booming, and uh, they thought that areas were getting tax breaks that didn't require tax breaks. Right. And as Jeff said, it became a, a political situation. They didn't realize we always live through cycles. Yeah. And when the cycles go down, it's hard to replace the stuff and bring programs back. And, and relating to cycles, we have a 30-minute cycle, and the 30-minute cycle is up. <laughs> and, and I'd like to thank uh, Jeff Levine, Joel Pickett, Ralph Esposito, and Frank Siami. See you next week. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns & Gian Tomasi, Grubb & Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa & Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner & Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, 
Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Urban American, The Wickoff Group.